When we think of orcs, they often seem distant, monstrous creatures, far removed from anything human. In the Lord of the Rings, they serve the dark wills of Sauron and Saruman, or serve themselves, killing and destroying everything in their path. At first glance, they appear to be as different from us as night is from day. But what if that distance isn't as great as it seems? What if orcs, in all their brutality, reflect something familiar? Something we all carry within us? Are we really so different from orcs? And if not, what does that mean for how we understand evil, both in Tolkien's world and our own? Tolkien's orcs aren't just mindless creatures. They embody the worst impulses of human nature, the capacity for cruelty, aggression, blind obedience, selfishness, and the delight in killing and destroying. They are in many ways the metaphorical demons of human nature, and the very name Orc actually means demon. In the trenches of World War I, Tolkien would witness firsthand the cruelty and barbarity of human nature. His experiences deeply influenced his vision of Middle-earth, and there are many locations that share similarities to the battlefields of the war, like the Dead Marshes and the Plains of Gorgoroth. The dehumanizing nature of war brings out the worst in us, and on both sides, acts of cruelty would be committed. New machines would be invented for the single purpose of killing as many as possible. These exact machines might have been invented by orcs in our own world, as we can read in The Hobbit. It is not unlikely that they invented some of the machines that have since troubled the world, especially the ingenious devices for killing large numbers of people at once. The wheels and engines and explosions always delighted them, and also not working with their own hands more than they could help. But in those days, in those wild parts, they had not advanced, as it is called, so far. It wasn't hard to imagine these soldiers, crushed by fear and hate, becoming like orcs, serving powers far greater than themselves, with little regard for morality or compassion. As Tolkien later described in his letters, orcs were not a distant, otherworldly evil. They were reflections of the worst that men could become when driven by blind obedience, hatred, and the corrupting influence of war. Yes, I think the orcs as real a creation as anything in realistic fiction. Your vigorous words will describe the tribe. Only in real life, they are on both sides of course, but romance has grown out of allegory and its wars are still derived from the inner war of allegory, in which good is on one side and various modes of badness on the other. In real, exterior life, men are on both sides, which means a motley alliance of orcs, beasts, demons, plain natural honest men and angels. But it does make some difference who are your captains and whether they are orc-like per se, and what it is all about or thought to be. It is even in this world possible to be more or less in the wrong or in the right. Tolkien saw orcs on both sides of the conflict, the uniformity of soldiers, the ceaseless destruction, and the laws of individual humanity in the cares of war were not limited to the enemy. They were universal traits of a world that had descended into violence and madness. This first had the experience of human degeneration, where compassion was lost and cruelty reigned, gave birth to his vision of the orcs as a dark mirror to our own capacity for evil. And this is what orcs are in the law. Unlike men, elves and dwarves, the orcs delight in destruction and killing. It is their soul joy in the world, and so they are the perfect instrument for Sauron to use. As Aulis says in the Silmarillion, we are creators because we are created through the thoughts of the ultimate creator, Eru Iluvita. Creation is seen as an extension of Eru's thoughts an expression of divine will, so to destroy, to corrupt, to cause disharmony, is that of Morgoth, and goes against the intentions of Eru. This, however, does not mean other races were incapable of committing evil, as Tolkien states in letter 212. The fall of corruption, therefore, of all the things in it, and all the inhabitants of it, was a possibility, if not inevitable. Trees may go bad, as in the old forest, ills may turn into orcs, and if this required the special perversive malice of Morgoth, still elves themselves could do evil deeds. Even the good Valar, as inhabiting the world, could at least err, as the great Valar did in their dealings with the elves, or as the lesser of their kind, 
as the Astari or wizards could in various ways become self-seeking. Since orcs embody destruction, corruption and disharmony, they are fundamentally opposed to the will of Eru Iluvatar, whose intent is for creation to flourish in harmony. The orcs who delight in chaos, murder and destruction exist as a manifestation of Morgoth's desire to twist and defile Eru's creations. This makes them a stark contrast to beings like the elves, whose purpose is to preserve and enhance the beauty of the world. When we think of orcs, or any creature like it, they may seem completely irredeemable, but to fully understand if they actually were, we must look at the nature of evil. Where does it come from, and how does it work in Middle-earth? The nature of evil follows a distinctly Augustinian philosophy. According to Saint Augustine, evil is not an independent force or substance, but rather a privation, a corruption, or distortion of the good. In this view, all creation is inherently good because it comes from God, or Eru as he is called in the universe. But evil arises when beings misuse their free will and fall away from their intended purpose. This philosophy fits perfectly with what we know from the Legendarium. Here evil manifests not as an equal and opposite force of good, but rather a corruption of it. We see it several times throughout the works. How Morgoth was the most powerful of the Ainur, but he sought only to bring glory to himself and not his maker. And it's much the same story with Sauron, who is a Maya, an angelic spirit, however a fallen angel, as we can read in the Fellowship of the Ring, the Council of Elrond. But nothing is evil in the beginning, even Sauron was not so. The Orcs are a prime example of the Augustinian view of the nature of evil. In the Silmarillion, we learn that Orcs were once elves, corrupted and twisted by Morgoth. In mockery of Eru's creations, elsewhere, like Morgoth's ring, it said that they were once men, but it makes little difference to our understanding of evil. It is when good has been twisted and corrupted. Evil is in other words, the absence of good. This also mirrors what Frodo says in The Lord of the Rings. The shadow that bred them can only mock. It cannot make, not real new things of its own. I don't think it gave life to the orcs. It only ruined them and twisted them. And if they are to live at all, they have to live like other living creatures. Foul waters and foul meats they'll take, if they can get no better, but not poison. This idea of corruption, rather than creation, is crucial to understanding evil in Middle-earth. Just as Morgoth cannot create life on his own, he can only corrupt what already exists. Orcs, then, are not inherently evil by their nature, but have been twisted away from their true purpose. In the Augustinian framework, evil lacks substance. It is not a thing in itself, but rather a distortion of something good. In fact, this idea of evil lacking substance is also seen with the Nazgul. They were once men, but through their rings, given to them by Sauron, they were twisted and corrupted. They had been reduced to a nothingness that could only interact with the seen world, thanks to the clothes given to them by Sauron himself. This is why they have to return to Mordor and gain new cloaks after they were defeated at the forts of Bruinen. This raises the question of whether orcs, as corrupted beings, are redeemable. In Tolkien's universe, redemption is a complex and often ambiguous subject. Free will is central to the moral structure of Middle-earth, and creatures like men and elves always have the possibility of choosing good over evil, no matter how far they have fallen. However, orcs present a special case because they have been so thoroughly corrupted that their ability to exercise free will is in doubt. Tolkien himself seemed to wrestle with this question. In his letters, he speculated on whether orcs had souls, or whether they were capable of true moral agency. In letter 153, he admits this uncertainty on the subject. There would be Morgoth's greatest sins, abuses of his highest privilege, or would be creatures begotten of sin, and naturally bad. I nearly wrote, irredeemably bad, but that would be going too far, because by accepting or tolerating their making, necessary to their actual existence, even orcs would become part of the world which is God's and ultimately good. But whether they could have souls or spirits seems a different question, and since in my myth, at any rate, I do not conceive of the making of souls or spirits, things of an equal order, if not an equal power to the Valar. As a possible delegation, I have represented at least the orcs as pre-existing real beings on whom the Dark Lord has exerted the fullness of his power in remodeling and corrupting them, not making them. 
that God would tolerate that seems no worse theology than the toleration of the calculated dehumanizing of men by tyrants that goes on today. This suggests that orcs might still retain some glimmer of their original nature, but they are so enslaved by their corruption and by the domination of dark powers like Sauron and Morgoth that they cannot exercise free will in any meaningful way. Their hatred and violence are in a sense imposed upon them, raising the tragic possibility that they are victims of evil as much as they are the perpetrators of it. They do seem unaware how they are being controlled and used by their masters. And if they have any kind of free will left in them, it seems twisted and turned into dark desires, only leading to their own selfish ambitions. But what when Sauron and Morgoth were defeated? Could they be redeemed then? I think many would say no, but perhaps it is not within us to answer if they are redeemable or not. Perhaps the only one that can answer and decide that is Eru himself. As Tolkien writes, With regard to the Lord of the Rings, I cannot claim to be a sufficient theologian to say whether my notion of orcs is heretical or not. I don't feel under any obligation to make my story fit with formalized Christian theology, though I actually intended it to be consonant with Christian thought and belief, which is asserted somewhere, Book 5, page 190, where Frodo asserts that the orcs are not evil in origin. We believe that, I suppose, of all humankinds and sons and breeds, though some appear both as individuals and groups to be, by us at any rate, unredeemable. So, as mentioned, the orcs are as much victims of evil as they are the perpetrators of it. They are the soldiers on the battlefield, committing crimes of war, while those that started these wars sit back home in safety. It is hard not to see the resemblance to both the world wars, and how young men died like flies on the battlefields, cannon fodder, unknowingly exploited, often willingly, as young men seek recognition by their elders, society, or simply their brothers in arms, perhaps unblindly believing to find glory on the battlefield. They are blind and unable to see how they are being used, just like the orcs. Throughout the ages, so many young men have eagerly thrown their lives away, seeking bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth, as Shakespeare would express it. Perhaps it is, and always have been, in our nature to go to war and seek out glory on the battlefield, but by doing so, we end up being more like orcs than men. It is the classic tale of the hero who sets out to slay the monster, only to become one in the process. In the books, Sam questions the evilness of a Haradrim soldier, as we can read. It was Sam's first view of a battle of men against men, and he did not like it much. He was glad that he could not see the dead face. He wondered what the man's name was and where he came from, and if he was really evil of heart, or what lies or threats had led him on the long march from his home, and if he would not really rather have stayed there in peace. It is not hard to imagine he would rather have stayed home, and perhaps the orcs are not that different. In the two towers, Sam overhears the conversation between Gorbag and Shagrat, where they both express a desire for a different life. A life away from war, and the life without masters, I highly doubt it would be a life of peace, and I don't think they would suddenly stop destroying and killing. Quite the contrary. Perhaps they would only rise up to become lesser successors of Sauron and his evil. And upon land, beast, and men, they would show as little mercy as Sauron does. Such is the nature of orcs. They are selfish, unable to love, unable to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, and they have no sense of honor or fellowship. For this reason they are irredeemable, unless through the grace of Eru. But this is exactly what makes them fail in the end, and unable to overcome the corruption of evil. In times of war, the absence of good is often true. Even for the innocent, little to no mercy will be shown. As Tolkien also expressed, as the Second World War was about to end, for his son Christopher, who served in the Royal Air Force, he wrote the following. The appalling destruction and misery of this war amount hourly. Destruction of what should be, indeed is, the commonwealth of Europe and the world. If mankind were not so besotted, wealth the laws of which will affect us all, victors or not. Yet people gloat to hear of the endless lines, 40 miles long, of miserable refugees, women and children, pouring west, dying on the way. There seem no bowels of mercy or compassion, no imagination left in this dark diabolic hour, by which I do not mean that it may not all, in the present situation, mainly 
not solely created by Germany, be necessary and inevitable. But why gloat? We were supposed to have reached a stage of civilization in which it might still be necessary to execute a criminal, but not to gloat or to hang his wife and child by him while the orc crowd hooted. The destruction of Germany, be it 100 times merited, is one of the most appalling world catastrophes. Well, well, you and I can do nothing about it. And that should be a measure of the amount of guilt that can justly be assumed to attach to any member of a country who is not a member of its actual government. Well, the first war of the machines seems to be drawing to its final, inconclusive chapter, leaving, alas, everyone the poorer, many bereaved or maimed, and millions dead. And only one thing triumphant, the machines. As the servants of the machines are becoming a privileged class, the machines are going to be enormously more powerful. What's the next move? Perhaps it is more clear to us now that perhaps we have seen orcs in our own lifetime. Given the current situation of the world, many atrocities are committed almost daily, and there are those that cheer as the innocent suffer. So what can we do to prevent ourselves from becoming like orcs? This is why The Lord of the Rings is a perfect story. It teaches us about the good in the world, friendship, self-sacrifice, mercy, and the will to oppose evil even when all things seem hopeless, even if you're all alone. We must care for each other, even our enemies, and delight more in creating, healing, and growing, rather than killing and destroying. We can be like Faramir and refuse to use the ring, even if we think it can be used for good. To me, Faramir is the ideal warrior of man, someone every soldier should aspire to be like. Not only does he exemplify true wisdom, but he is also closely connected to Tolkien himself, and so also expressed Tolkien's own thoughts. He is, as Tolkien wrote, modest, fair-minded, and scrupulously just, and very merciful. It is certainly something the world needs in its darkest hours. This is also why my favorite quote comes from Faramir. I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. And so we come to the end of this video. If you liked it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe, and share it with others. Special thanks to all the members and patrons of the channel. You guys are the best. Thank you. Check out one of these videos next. Farewell till next time.